You primarily know me as Premiere Gal for video editing tips on this channel, but I also share some Photoshop tips as well, especially when it comes to kind of thumbnail design and product design. So I'm sharing a tip I wish I knew when I started in Photoshop, but I recruited all of these amazing Photoshop artists and designers to share tips they wish they knew as well. All right, without further ado, let's go ahead and jump on in. First up, we have a game-changing layer masking tip for beginners from Anna McNaught. And if you're not following her on Instagram, go check her out. She is an amazing Photoshop artist creating beautiful dreamscapes and you can learn from her courses there on Instagram. All right, Anna, take it away. So when I first started in Photoshop, I was actually erasing my images instead of layer masking when I was trying to cut something out. And it was really bad because that's destructive editing. And so then I wasn't able to go back and fix anything. So I have this photo that I took in Iceland and I feel like the sky is a little bit boring. And when I was first getting started, I might've used the eraser tool and come in here and just started erasing out like this. And it would have been a disaster, but now it's it's so easy because I can just select this. I'll come up and go select subject. And then I'm just going to come down to this little button right here and click add layer mask. Just like that, we get this perfect layer mask. I can come in and using a black brush, I can just erase myself here like that rather than using the eraser tool. But then if later on I come back and I decide that I actually wanna add myself back in, I can easily do that too, just by continuing to edit that layer mask. And Anna, I can't tell you how amazing this tip is for me because for the longest time, I would make a selection, press Command J to create a new layer from the selection, which was destructive. And now on to my tip, which has to do with artboards. Inside of Photoshop, when you create a new project, I would actually go to film and video and I would choose 1280 by 720 for when I'm designing a thumbnail. And normally I would just be like, okay, let's hit create, but you can actually start with artboards, which gives you more opportunity for variation. Let me explain what I mean. So click artboards and click create. And you'll see that you're given an artboard and this can be one of your designs. If you use the selection tool to select the artboard name, you can see that you can press plus to create another artboard or you can choose one of these other ones to create as many as you want and pressing command minus and the H tool, you can see that I have now three artboards that I can build from. Also, you can go and click on the artboard tool by pressing V if you want to as well. And you can click and create a custom vertical design, for example. And if it's not exact, you can actually go up here and adjust the width. So for example, 720 by 1280, which is the vertical version of the landscape. So these are all blank artboards that I can build from, but let me actually show you a real example. So here's a thumbnail that Rickard on the team designed. Hi Rickard, he's also editing this right now. He shared this with me and I'm like, maybe I wanna try out a different color of the font. Rather than selecting this and changing the font on this one and having to go back to redo it if I don't like it, what I can do is I can actually press the option key on my keyboard or alt if you're on a PC and drag this artboard to duplicate it. And now on this new option, I can select the text and change it to white, for example. So then I can be like, huh, which one's better, white or yellow? And kind of send it around the team to kind of figure out what would work best. So this is a non-destructive way to compare different designs without overriding your current design. So artboards are the way to go. Up next is the Photoshop master himself, Unmesh, my friend and creator of Pix Imperfect. If you have not heard of Pix Imperfect, what are you doing? And today Unmesh has an amazing tip for understanding blend modes inside of Photoshop. For a long time, I used to think that the normal blend mode is just the default blend mode and acts as a picture on top of a picture. So here we have a green circle. On top of that, we have a yellow circle with the normal blend mode. So a picture on top of a picture, not rocket science. However, it is not always the case. So here we have a new subject on top of a new background. Now the subject is too contrasty, so we need to decrease it. So for it, let's create a curves adjustment layer. Click on the adjustment layer icon and then choose curves. Right hand side is for the highlights, left hand side for the shadows. So let's make the highlights darker and the shadows slightly 
brighter like this. Now the subject is matching but this adjustment is also falling in the background. If you put them in a group by holding the control or command, selecting both the layers and then press control or command G, right now this adjustment is inside of a group. However, this adjustment is still affecting the background. Why is that? Whenever you create a group, the default blend mode is pass through, which lets the adjustments pass through the group. However, if you change the blend mode of the group back to normal, the adjustments would be locked and only applied to the elements of the group. So right now, the adjustment is only being applied to the subject. Thank you so much, Kelsey, for having me and trusting my content now and six years ago. I am so freaking proud of you since our last collaboration six years ago. I mean, you were just starting out your YouTube channel and now you have almost 5 million subscribers. It's insane, so bravo. And up next is Dan Ski from the UK. He's an incredible designer. All right, Dan, hit us with your tip. Okay, my tip is about creating grungy text effects in Photoshop. We're gonna be doing this using displacement maps. And this is perfect if you're a beginner. First of all, let's select the text layer, right click and convert this to a smart object. Now that's done, go to filter and down to distort and select displace. And this window pops up. The higher you increase these values, the crazier your effect is going to be. We'll go with 20 for now, but we can always change this later on. You can see I've got a nice texture labs texture here. And the thing with using a texture for a displacement map is that you need the file to be a PSD and black and white. And you can see now we have that grungy text effect applied. And if I turn this off and on, you can see the difference. Now, if I zoom in really close, you can see we have a little bit of distortion around the edges there. One way to get around this is to go to filter, blur, Gaussian blur, and we'll add like a really small amount. So maybe 0.2 or 0.3. This will of course depend on your document size. And if I zoom back out, it just helps really kind of sell the authenticity of that effect. Okay, now I'm gonna turn on this texture layer here. This is the same texture, but inverted. And at the moment, the colors are black and white, but I'm going to add a gradient map. So let's do that in the bottom right corner. Click on the gradient slide. And what this enables me to do is remap the black and the white in the image to two different colors. So the black is great, I love that. But what I'm gonna do is double click on the white and we'll change this to a red. Let's click OK. And last of all, if I double click on the thumbnail for the smart object, I can go back inside here. Let's go and change that canvas size. We'll make this a lot bigger. Let's go for 2000 by 1000 so we have more space to work with. And I can of course change this to any font. So let's go for good old times regular, there we go. And we simply have to just save this file and all of those changes will be updated in the main document. Thank you for that one, Dansky. I also have another tip for you. You know, like those cool product mock-ups, whether it's for like coffee or for a beer or for a software box, those you can get as templates. And I get most of my templates from Envato Elements, which is perfect because they reached out and they sponsored today's video. On Envato Elements, I use a ton of their stock video and video templates, of course, for the videos that we produce here on YouTube, but it also has a jackpot of graphic templates as well. So if you select Adobe Photoshop, it'll only show the product mockups for Photoshop. So you can see these flyer mockups, resume, trifolds, MacBook laptop display, a car logo template, frame mockup, all of these here that you can use. And with Elements, it's an unlimited subscription. So you can download as much as you want to try it out. So what's really cool about these templates is that you can download them and then just replace each frame here with your own design. So making it really easy to make a fast mock-up. And in addition to templates, you can see that there's graphics, you can get backgrounds, illustrations, and textures all for your design. So if we wanna try this one, we can just click on download. And as you can see, there are two layers here from the layers panel. Put your design here and put your design here. So all you have to do is click on the thumbnail here to double click to open it up as a smart object. And then you can drag your design here or you can you know, come up with your own design here in this flat space. And then it will automatically put it on the software box. So I have the design here. This is actually Rickard's work again. Good job, Rickard. So here I have the design for the cover and I just drag and drop it here and then hit Command S to save. And now when we go back to the software box, it's automatically composited. We can do the same with the side one as well. Let's drag the side box here, save. And look at that, we have our composite here and you can see that there's a shadow that we can turn on and off. Let's say you wanna make a yellow background, you can change the color fill here as well. So working with product 
mock-up templates can help you create a really fast design even if you don't have experience you know designing a mock-up from scratch so if you're interested in trying out Envato Elements you can use my link below to get 70% off your first month to download and try out as much as you want video and design assets included. All right, thanks so much Envato for sponsoring. And now we have a tip from Charlie Murray. She's a talented brand and marketing designer. All right, Charlie, take it away. Sometimes when you're trying to brighten up a photo or just like create some more contrast using the image adjustment tools, it's adjusting all of the image at once. And you can find it might blow out some areas or make some areas too dark and just not get quite what you want. So when this happens, we can use the dodge and burn tool to lighten or darken certain areas of the photo. These tools work kind of like the brush tool does in Photoshop. You can change the size, you can change the hardness of the edges, and then you can use them to like paint over your photo. The dodge tool will brighten areas. So as you can see in this example, I'm brightening my face uh, for a YouTube thumbnail and maybe brighten my hand as well to make that stand out from the background. Then I find the burn tool really handy for darkening some areas of the photo. Like say, if I wanted to add some text to my thumbnail in this area and there's not enough contrast between my shirt and the type, I can use the burn tool to just darken that area behind it. It's also useful to use for darkening any areas of the photo that you want to like take attention away from so that you remain focused on the main subject. That's a great tip, Charlie. I'm gonna start using it on text in my thumbnails going forward. All right, up next is Frank from G'day Frank. He's an amazing brand designer and guru. All right, Frank, take it away. So there are a few different ways to recolor an element in Photoshop. We're gonna use an adjustment layer. It's called the hue saturation adjustment layer. You might've tried this before where you use the sliding scale of hue, but what happens is it changes the full gamut of color in your image and we only wanna change one particular color. If you go to this little extra icon that you see up here to modify the saturation or the hue, by a particular color, what it will give you is an eyedropper tool where you can eyedropper on the image element that you want. So there's a certain color that you wanna change. And we're gonna pick this part of the yellow here. And then we're gonna shift the hue slider to go towards the pink values. This is a quick and easy way to change those colors, especially if you're trying to color match a certain color and the hue is slightly off or the saturation slightly off, you can use this tool to just quickly bump up that color. All right, thanks so much, Frank, for that tip. And now it's Tyler Stallman. He has a really great photo compositing tip. All right, Tyler, take it away. When you're compositing different images, whether that's a sky replacement or heavy retouching, often things like noise and grain will make them not sit together as nicely as they could. So I'll try to create a quick fake example of that. I'll just uh, do a quick sky replacement here. And the sky image is taken on a full frame mirrorless, whereas this photo is taken on an iPhone. So if I zoom way in here, you can see they definitely don't match. This has quite a bit of like noise removal and smoothing in the image, whereas the sky is much more detailed and a lot sharper. So let's do this the non-destructive way. I'm going to go to layer, new fill layer, and we'll do a solid color, name it grain, saturation zero, brightness 50%, click okay. Then I'll go to filter, noise, add noise. And right now this is an adjustment layer. I can't have noise on it, so we're gonna have to rasterize and add some amount of grain. Two or three is a safe amount because we can always reduce the opacity afterwards. Now, if you zoom way, way in, you can see there's the grain. There's a bunch of speckled pixels that were previously uniform. I can go to my blend mode and apply overlay. And then all you see is that grain. And if I want to, I could always just back that off a little bit if it's too strong. So if your Photoshopped composite is gonna look like it was taken in camera, it should have the same grain, the same types of blur. All these image attributes should be shared from the original source image and the image that you've composited onto it. And this is especially important if your image is gonna be viewed in high resolution. Thanks so much, Tyler. And now we have Kyle Meshna, who has a really, really useful tool for editing photos in Photoshop using Luminosity masks. Luminosity masks allow you to make precise selections based on the brightness values of your image. This means that you can target specific areas such as the highlights or the shadows of an image and apply adjustments to just that portion of the image. I like to think of this as forcing you to color inside the lines of a coloring book. First things first, we'll want to duplicate our background layer by hitting Control or Command J. 
Next, we'll come over to the channel section. Now we want to hold control on a PC or command on Mac, and then click that little thumbnail right here. This will create a selection of the brightest parts of the image for us. Now, if we pop back over to the layers tab, we'll have that selection made and we can do all kinds of stuff with it. My personal favorite is to use this for dodge and burn. So let's create a new layer and then add a mask to that layer. This will automatically load the selection that we've previously made as a mask, but it's not just any mask, it's a luminosity mask. Let's change the blend mode of this layer to soft light and then brush in some warm orange tones at around a 5% flow. You'll notice that if we paint over the bright spots, it'll add a nice warm color there, but if we paint over the dark spots, nothing happens because the luminosity mask is helping us to color inside the lines. Let's go back over to channels and again, control or command click on the thumbnail again. But now to select the dark spots, we need to simply press shift control or command I on the keyboard. Let's come back over to our layer and create a new layer again, and then another layer mask. We'll do the same thing and change this to soft light blending mode. But now if we paint with a black brush at 5% flow, we're able to darken up the darker parts of the image without messing up the bright spots. This will look super subtle at first, but once we look at the before and after, we'll notice that we've added a nice selective pop of contrast to the areas that we wanted to change without making a mess. I'm definitely going to use that tip going forward. I think it's a game changer when you're editing your photos. So thank you so much for sharing that. And lastly, but certainly not least, is Nathaniel Dotson. And he runs Tutvid, which is an amazing YouTube channel that you should check out. All right, Nathaniel, take it away. Let's talk about the export as feature in Adobe Photoshop. It's a great tool to use. We have here our first PSD, and this is a document that has multiple artboards. So let me first show you. You go file, you choose export as, and Photoshop is intelligent enough to know, hey, when export as comes up, each of these individual artboards, they need to be their own file when we export them. You can shift click all of them and you can change all of them to be exported as a JPEG, change the quality, the size, the canvas size, all sorts of things. You can export multiple versions. That is one, maybe that's half size, double size, triple size, things like that. It can be important if you're working with a developer and they need multiple versions of the same graphic. Uh, then over here, we have a bunch of graphics on screen for this interface. Uh, there's a, a lot of different things you can do. First of all, you could of course export everything as a big image so people can just look at it and see what you're working with. But maybe the developer says, hey, I need that left side navigation bar as a big image. Well, you can just select that layer group and that's all it is. It's not an artboard. It's just a layer group in the layers panel, right click and choose export as. And when I do this, just with this layer group, you can see it's going to take everything in the layer group and export it as an image together. If I open up the layer group and I select all the groups within the layer group and right click on them and choose export as, you're going to see each layer group is getting exported as its own file, but that's not where it ends. Let's say we just need to export this dashboard, hello, welcome back, etc. text up here at the top. Hold down your alter option key and click on the eyeball and Photoshop will shut off all the other layers except for the big title. But maybe we don't just wanna export this graphic. Maybe we wanna export the graphic, but make sure we're getting all the transparency around it. Like we want this little bit of text to be in this specific place in this bigger image when we export it. Well, we can do that by having all those other layers shut off and then going file, export, export as, and Photoshop will keep that little graphic in its place and export the entirety of the rest of the image. And then back here on Photoshop, you can hold down alter option and click on the eyeball and turn all your layers back on so you don't need to go through and manually turn everything back on. So I hope all these tips were useful. If they were, be sure to give it a thumbs up and also do me a favor, go to my description box and go follow all those other creators so you can keep up to date with the latest photo and design tips. And if you wanna learn some more Photoshop tutorials from myself, I'll put a link right over here to my Photoshop playlist. And if you'd like to check out my brand new Premiere Gal Toolkit, which has over 920 different effects built into Premiere Pro in a panel, you can click right over here. And as always, keep creating better video and photo with Gal. See you next time. Bye. Did you know back in the day, there was no Photoshop?